Genesis 15, but we are going to read this time from verse 8. And he said, Lord, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And God said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece once again another, but the bird divided it not. And it came to pass, verse 17, came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamb that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. We have looked at these six elements of the covenant in the ancient Near East. We have looked at the preamble, the historical prologue. We've looked at stipulation and obligation, the document. The witnesses, we have looked at the invocation of causes and blessing. And last time, we concluded, as it were, looking at also the four different areas of biblical covenant. We're looking at biblical pattern of covenant. And we look at four rough areas. There's a statement of idea that was agreed on, and the agreement was sealed with an oath. Number three, there was invocation of cause that was often done. To ensure that the covenant will not be broken and number four we said the covenant was ratified by an external act or by ritual and that was actually where we spend most of our time one of those external art or ritual is the fact that the exchange gift or personal paraphernalia the fact that also the exchange names they eat covenant meal together and you see the way we apply some of these things to pass over meal to the lost table and also to marriage and finally, we said the covenant was sealed with ritual of blood letting and sprinkling. And we went to the Old Testament to see how that is played out. And also, we went to the New Testament, went to the book of Hebrews. The fact that the new covenant was ratified in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have seen this concept of kingdom. We have seen this concept of covenant. And as I was rounding up last time, I said that we need to understand that this concepts of kingdom and covenant they are fundamental they are central they are foundational to biblical revelation and that when we read the bible we must read the bible covenantally we must read the bible with this understanding of kingdom and with this understanding of covenant with this understanding of kingdom and with this understanding of covenant and particularly for us uh in our days we we need to remind ourselves about this because the truth is that even though these ideas are central to biblical revelation, the truth is that our in our world today, these concepts are foreign to us. They are foreign to our culture. They are foreign to our, our, our worldview. And this is why it is important and even more important for us to study this concept to study these ideas and to be able to see how we can get a handle and understanding of covenant. If marriage is understood rightly in biblical terms, that will have given us a very good example of what covenant is all about. But unfortunately today, marriage has been dumbed down. In fact, there are a lot of people that question the, the very institution of marriage. One word that usually crop up when we talk about covenant is this concept of contract, the concept of contract. And, and we've mentioned that we've used that word in this teaching. In those days, they also have the concept of covenant and the concept of contract. So we need to understand that even though there are some similarity between covenants and contract, we need to understand that there are some considerable differences between business contract or marketplace agreement and covenant, okay? And this is why oh, if marriage has been what marriage should be, that will have been the closest for us to understand covenant. But oftentimes, what most of us think about when we talk about covenant is to think about contract. In Genesis chapter 15, we see here when God came into covenant with Abraham. We've read it before, so now I want to compare it with another story. Now, let me lay a background for this story. This is, is a story of Solomon. This was after Solomon has been anointed as king. Before Solomon 
David wanted to build the temple of God and God said David cannot build it because his hand was full of blood. But God told David that his son after him will build the temple. Now this story we are going to read is a situation where Solomon was now getting ready to build the house of God. So Solomon contacted Hiram the king of Tyre and I want you to look at this story. This is an example of a contract. Remember what I said? Even in old days, they had contract. There was never, there was no confusion between contract and covenant. The Bible is not a contract. Marriage is not a contract. The Bible is a book of covenant. God is not a God of contract. God is a God of covenant. And covenant is the constitution of the kingdom, not contract. In the kingdom, the kingdom is about covenant. The kingdom is not about contract. Now, when you go to work, work is about contract. Work is not about covenant. But the kingdom of God is about covenant covenant. God is a God of covenant. Unfortunately, oftentimes we want to relate to God as a contract. You know, you give me that, I give you that. No, that is not the revelation of the kingdom of God. The the constitution of the kingdom of God is that of a covenant. So we are reading from 1 King chapter 5. We are reading verses 1 and 2. Then we will read verses 5 and 6. And then we'll read verses 10 to 11. One and two just to set this, the, the stage for us, the background. And Hiram king of Tyre sent his servant unto Solomon, for he has heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent, sent to Hiram saying. Now we have a situation here where Hiram, once he heard that Solomon has become the king in the place of his father, sent message to rejoice with him. Okay on the occasion of being king. But Solomon having received the envoy from Tyre, from the king, from King Hiram, Solomon has another issue on his mind. So Solomon in verse 2 then sent a message back to Hiram. And Solomon gave Hiram a proposal. Solomon asked Hiram to get into a contract with him. Solomon wants to build the house of God. And Solomon sent a message back to Hiram. Now let's read that from verse 5. And this was the, the message that Solomon sent back to him. And behold, I build, I propose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son whom I will set upon the throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. Now therefore, Command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. Now, the terms and the condition of the contract that Solomon was proposing was very clear. I, 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 have, I, have, I have a project in my hand. I want to build the house of the Lord. That is the project. This is my project. I want to do something now. I need something that you can provide. King Hiram, Hiram of Tyre. I need cedar wood. I need fir of wood from Lebanon. You have the skill. Your people have the skill. They can cut it down. They can get it to us. So if you can do that for me, that's what I need. If you can do that for me, I will. you name your price and I will pay you. That was the contract. Okay, you have what I need, provide the service, and I will pay you for the service. Whatever your price is, name your price, and I will pay it. And that is the contract. That is the proposal. And when you read down, you will see that Hiram was happy with Solomon's proposal. Hiram was happy to enter into a contract with Solomon. And that was what happened. Now, let's, let us read, let's jump down and read the outcome of this contract. So both of them enter into the contract. Verse 10. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. So Hiram fulfilled Solomon's terms of contract according to what Solomon desired. Hiram did it. He gave him the cedar tree and he gave him the fir tree. Verse 11. Did Solomon then fulfill his part of the contract? Yes. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measure of pure oil thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. Contract, terms of the contract fulfilled on both sides. 
Even though there are some similarities between covenants and contract, there are very deep differences between both of them. And that is what I just want to go through. And that is why I have read this story. The One of the most obvious difference between a covenant and a contract is the format. And you can see how formal <laughs> the contract between Solomon and the king of Haram was. Typically, a contract will have a date, list of parties. It would describe the desired transaction and then the transaction will be taken out, will be, will be, will be fulfilled. There may be witnesses. There can be, we may have to be a guarantee that the contract will be fulfilled and there will be witnesses. It is very formal. Now you can see that this format differed markedly from that of covenants. You didn't hear here about the shedding of blood. You didn't hear there about partners, you know, covenant meal. You didn't hear here about sprinkling of blood. You didn't hear here about exchange of names. You didn't hear here about exchange of personal paraphernalia. You didn't hear here about invocation of cause and blessing. Or you didn't hear here about God's being witness. Because once we start talking about covenant, we are lifting it up to a higher realm, to a divine realm, to another realm as it were. So you can see straight away this major, major difference between contract and covenant. Because covenant takes this agreement into a divine, another worldly dimension. There is a divine dimension to covenant. And that then gives it an eternal dimension to covenant. So that is the first contrast we see straight away. Once you start looking at contract and you look at covenant. Now, let's look at another difference. You're still using these two stories. Primarily, contract is thing-oriented, project-oriented. We have a project, you fulfill the project, so contract is thing-oriented. Yes, you need people, but you are, the people come secondary people are important in contract to the degree to which they fulfill the goal they fulfill the goal of you providing a service you providing thing and this is why unfortunately some employer will will take advantage of their employee or will look for cheap labor and we have that all over the world where sometimes in the western world people enjoy you know low cost uh, amenities and facilities and materials because they are being produced cheaply in third world. And in, in such often time, very, very poor working condition. We, we, we enjoy the labor of people that work under very poor condition because those companies want to produce this product cheaply so that their products can sell. And there's a whole lot of that happening. So in the contract, the primary thing here is fulfilling the terms and the terms of the contract, providing service, providing thing. People become secondary. People can be discarded. People can be trampled upon just so that they can fulfill the term of the contract. That is contract. But in covenant, it's not the case. In covenant, covenant is people-oriented. Don't misunderstand me. In covenant, there will be service. In covenant, there will be things to be done. But in covenant, the primary focus of covenant is people. We've mentioned this before. Covenant is about relationship. Covenant is about intimacy. Covenant is about people. And that is why the topmost character of covenant is loyalty loyalty because whereas contract is about thing covenant is about people this is why when we understand that marriage is about people it's not about thing it's not about what can i get from her or what can i get from him when we understand that covenant is about people how can i be a blessing to him how can i be a blessing to her and that is what covenant is about so that is another major difference between a contract and a covenant the story we have read in in in, in the book of king in first king chapter 5 is about 
you know, fulfilling a project, fulfilling a contract. It's not about the people that are cutting down the log. It's not about the servant of Hiram. It's not about the servant of, of David, I mean, of Solomon. It's not even about Solomon himself. It's not even about the king of Hiram himself. It's about both of them doing a project together, fulfilling their terms of the contract. But in covenant, compare that to the covenant between Jonathan and David. Here is about David. Here is about Jonathan. The heart of Jonathan was knitted to the heart of David. And then he removed his garment. And then he removed his weapon of war and gave it to David. It's about that relationship, that intimacy, that brotherhood, that sisterhood. It is about that. Praise the Lord. And as we are talking about it, we need to be understanding that this is the type of relationship that we have with God. Yes, we will have activities. Yes, we will do things. But God's love for us is not because I came to church. It's not because I gave money. Now, that is important because if I love him, I will be where his people are. I will give unto his cause. But it's primarily because he loves me, because he loves you, because God is love. So that is the second differences that we notice here. The, the, the next one, the third one, the obligation of a contract require fulfillment of duty. And we've mentioned that. That is an obligation. The obligation of a contract is about fulfilling duty. That's the terms and the condition. While the obligation of a covenant is one of loyalty, I mentioned that in talking about the orientation. So the obligation, you see, in, in a contract, I don't have to like you. <laughs> I don't have to love you. I don't, you, you can hate me. It's irrelevant. The most important thing is for you to fulfill your part of the terms and conditions. That is not the case in covenant. You cannot enter into a covenant being, you know, indifference to whether he likes me or he loves me. No, 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 no. That is not covenant. That is a contract. In a, in a, when you go to work, you don't have to like your, your, your workmate. It would be nice if you like them. <laughs> it would be nice. But the most important thing is for you to come and get your job done. But that is not the case in covenant. Yes, in covenant, there is job to be done. But it is important in covenant for the covenant partner to be loyal, to trust one another, to love one another, to have intimacy. They are brothers. They are sisters. That is a covenant. And that is the type of relationship that we should have in churches. You have broken the time of contract if you don't fulfill your duty. You have broken the term of contract, but you have broken the term of covenant if you are this lawyer. This is very important. For a contract is all about fulfilling your duty. For a covenant is all about that relationship. Are you loyal to that relationship? Are you loyal? Are you committed to that relationship? That is the heart of a covenant. At the heart of covenant then is the relationship between the parties. Characterized by faithfulness, characterized by loyalty, characterized by love. It is very, very important. And as I mentioned this thing, the most important thing here that I want us to see is actually to understand how this throw light on our relationship with God. Now, let me, let me round up today by talking about one or two more differences between contract and covenant. Remember what we said, they have similarities but they have differences. In a contract, both parties negotiate and we saw that in in the story of Solomon and Haram, the king of Tyre. In a contract, both, of, both parties sit down at the table and they negotiate. And they agree if the terms and the conditions are mutually beneficial. So in a contract, it's all about negotiation. I want to buy. You want to sell. You are happy with the price I am paying. And I'm happy with the services that you are providing. That is a contract. However, in a covenant, that is not the case. A covenant is not both parties actually negotiating. Now, we have mentioned this before. Covenant is initiated only by the greater party. It's not a round table. We don't come to God and say, God, let's think about this. No. In a covenant, it is the overlord. It is the Caesarian king. It is the greater of the two parties that initiate the covenant. In covenant, there is no negotiation. Negotiation has no place in a covenant. In a marriage situation, God has already laid the ground rule for marriage. We don't come there and begin to negotiate. 
Okay? There is, there is a position and a duty for the husband. There is a position and a duty for the wife. There is a position and a duty for the children. That is the way God has made it. And our ideology and our feelings and politically correctness will not change that. In a covenant, the covenant, the, the terms are set by the covenant greater party. And number two, there's no place for negotiation. The greater in grace offer his help. The initiative is his. The lesser can reject it. Okay? The lesser can reject it, but cannot negotiate. The lesser can accept or reject it, but there is no negotiation. Again, the greater party has done this for the good and for the help of the lesser party. Now, this is the beauty of a covenant. This is the beauty because the man is coming into covenant with you because of love, because of faithfulness on the platform of loyalty and love. And that is very, very important. Finally, finally for today, as we round up, one more contrast, and this is very important, one more contrast between a contract and a covenant. And I really want you to hear this. A contract is for a fixed duration. Whereas covenant commonly is forever until death do us part in marriage. Contract is usually for a specified period duration for a specified period for a limited period so when you go into a contract you you specify how long this contract is going to last sometimes people go into a contract for six months for a year okay sometimes the the period of the contract can be delineated by what can stop the contract but in a contract contract is always always for a specific period whereas covenant is commonly forever. Our relationship with God is forever. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nothing, neither height nor depth of which will separate us from the love of God. In fact, we are the only one that can separate ourselves by breaking that covenant, by turning away from our covenant partner. So we need to understand that our covenant is commonly forever. So let's rush over as we round up. We can see that number one, there's a lot of overlap between contract and covenant, but there's a lot of difference. We see the difference in the, in the format. We see the difference in their oriented goal. We see the difference in the obligation of the, of the, of the covenant or contract. We see the difference in the negotiation and then we see the difference in the duration of the covenant. And I'm, I'm hoping and I'm trusting God that as we listen to this, we'll begin to allow the Holy Spirit to use this message to actually, you know, throw light on our relationship with God. So that we begin, you and I begin to understand the type of relationship we will have with God and begin to walk in the reality of it. And this will feed our faith, feed our faith so that we can be men and women of strong faith. Praise the Lord. And if you are listening to me, God loves you. And God so loves you that he has provided a platform for you to come into a covenant with him. That's through the cross of Jesus by his blood. All you need to do is to agree. You cannot negotiate. There, You cannot negotiate how you get into God's kingdom. That's not up for negotiation. All you can do is to receive it. And remember, this is an offer of love. You cannot get this type of offer anywhere else. So do it today. Receive this offer. Give your life to him. He will come in. What is he asking for, for you? Just want you to be a friend. Your loyalty to him. And it is for your own good and for my own good. Do it today. Ask Jesus to come into your love and be your Lord and Savior. And he will. He will be your friend, your father, your guide. And when this is all over, you will spend eternity with him in the new heaven and the new heart.